Over the past few years, this country has seen a dramatic rise in partisan animosity with dangerous implications for the health of our democracy. Judy Woodruff profiles some of the work being done to understand what's driving that trend and what might be done to reverse it. It's part of her ongoing series, America at a Crossroads. I would describe my political views as the new right. I say that I'm left. If researchers are right, this Heineken beer commercial, which first premiered in 2017, holds important lessons for our democracy today. It's absolutely critical that trans people have their own voice. That's not right. You can't, you know, you're, you're a man, be a man, or you're a female, be a female. In it, people on different sides of the political divide in the United Kingdom are interviewed about hot button issues, then paired up and asked to build a bar, a task designed to create a sense of teamwork. Let me help you. Let's just that bit there. Through a series of prompts, they get to know each other. We know each other better than people who've known each other for 10 minutes should. You seem quite ambitious and positive, and you've got this really, um, Got a glow. Do you know what I'm <laughs> Your aura is pretty cool. And then are shown clips from the interviews they gave earlier. So transgender, it is very odd. We're not set up to understand or see things like that. I am a daughter, a wife. I am transgender. An awkward moment, and then a question posed. Do they want to continue to talk over a beer or walk away because of their differences. I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> you happy for a second then. What's interesting from our perspective is that showing people this video, mm -hmm. uh, was, it was actually the number one intervention we found for reducing partisan animosity. So. Rob Weller is a sociologist at Stanford University who directs the Polarization and Social Change Lab, dedicated to studying what's driving division in this country and how we might overcome it. I mean, the way we think about it, polarization has essentially paralyzed uh, certainly the federal government, but also a lot of state and, and local governments. And so if you're working on a problem where you want to leverage the power of government to take action, most of the time you're going to need to have some kind of plan to deal with polarization. Can people, bringing people together to talk about their disagreements, help? On the day we visited, PhD candidate Luisa Santos presented some early findings into her research on how participants on different sides of the political spectrum engaged in conversations online over divisive issues like immigration, gun control, and climate change. Conversations can actually reduce people's animosity, improve trust, and reduce uh, more of this engagement. To her surprise, she found participants were far better at disagreeing than she'd expected. Similar to other people, I had <laughs> negative expectations about how these dialogues will go. And I think partially because what we see in social media and we, we see when we turn on our TV is just these really negative, heated interactions with um, people who disagree. Um, so one of the reasons why is because people have such negative expectations that when they find a reasonable person that disagrees with them on these issues, they're a bit shocked. That's reflected in Willer's own research, too, that the way Americans have sorted into political tribes with little contact across difference has led to strong stereotyping of the other side. Technology's definitely contributed to it. People are more likely to be consuming information in uh, you know, a homogenous information environment. There's also a phenomenon that's been called the big sort, where Democrats or Republicans are increasingly likely to live in different parts of the country, to work in different occupations, and so you're less likely to encounter somebody who is a friend of yours from high school or a friend of yours from your workplace or is an acquaintance in your neighborhood who you have a positive feeling towards but has uh, a different party affiliation from you. Last year, Willer's team partnered with researchers from four other universities to test different approaches for increasing support for democracy over party. Things like honoring election results, regardless of the outcome, ratcheting down partisan animosity, and decreasing support for political violence. 
They crowdsource hundreds of ideas from academics, activists, and nonprofits, then tested 25 of them on a representative sample of Americans online. I've been brought up in a way where everything's black and white, but life isn't black and white. Yeah, I'm just me. The Heineken beer commercial was among the most successful. I think it's a good example of something that's called vicarious contact. So uh, one thing that can be helpful is for people to have a warm, direct interaction across a group divide and find their stereotypes disabused, develop a personal connection. Sometimes we can't do that. We definitely can't do that easily at scale. But what if you watched the same thing happen? You know, what if you watch two people from either side of a divide have an interaction? You then kind of vicariously have that interaction yourself. We are currently in the final days of campaigning against each other. But our common values transcend our political differences. And the strength Another intervention that showed promise, politicians announcing their support for voting and elections, regardless of the outcome. Something Utah Republican Governor Spencer Cox did with his rival, Democrat Chris Peterson, during their 2020 race. That whether you vote by mail or in person, we will fully support the results of the upcoming presidential election, regardless of the outcome. Although we sit on different sides of the aisle, we are both committed to American civility and a peaceful transition of power. We found when you show people that, that it increases people's commitment to democracy, people in the general public. And as it's, you watch the video, it's a very powerful video. It's a cool thing that they did. Could we get high level Democrat and Republican donors who care about democratic stability to say, I'm giving money to this race, but if you, it is contingent on you participating in something like this. Taking a different tack, yet another intervention highlighted how bad things can get when countries betray democratic norms, showing news clips of civil and economic unrest in countries like Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Russia, and Turkey. And when people saw this, you know, their reaction was, oh, I need to actually prioritize democratic norms more. Democratic backsliding is not something to be trifled with, and they, they showed less support for democratic backsliding from their own party. But Willer says the number one strategy for reducing support for political violence, simply accurately describing what members of one party believe to the other. Democrats estimate Republicans' support for political violence at levels that are three, 400 percent higher than they really are, and it's pretty much the same for Republicans perceiving Democrats' support for violence. When you give people corrective information that fixes those misperceptions, you find that people then will ratchet down their own support for political violence. It's almost as though people are uh, supporting political violence at the levels they do because they don't want to bring a knife to a gunfight. They assume they're in a gunfight. When they find out they're not, they sort of stand down a little bit. And we even find those effects can persist for weeks afterwards, even if you just give people you know, a small amount of statistical information in, a, in an online survey. I mean, you came up with that conclusion last summer of 2022. Is it having an effect, I mean, in getting the word out that this is what you've learned? No, <laughs> not really, I don't think. Yeah, we, uh, we don't have a clear means to mobilize that information that we've learned about what works and what's true uh, about what people think and, and put it into action. Then you have, uh, most of all, I think social media platforms, but also cable news networks have a lot of potential influence, a lot of power over the problem, not a lot of motivation to take action on this problem. In fact, they may have the reverse. They may be uh, benefiting you know, from, from polarization and from increasing it. And then you don't have really any obvious actors who have an interest in uh, you know, and the means to effectively intervene on, on this problem. So while we're waiting for cable news to uh, change some of its typical ways of focusing on division uh, in politics, while we're waiting on social media, while we're waiting on the donors to reward uh, working together rather than going to the extremes, what can, what can people do? What can individuals do, do you think? Well, I think one thing is to engage across lines of political difference in a respectful way, you know, try to run towards the fire rather than away from it, you know, have conversations with your uh, you know, socialist or, or Tea Party supporting uncle. It's always the uncles, I don't know why. Uh, but, uh, you know, whoever that person is in your family or your neighborhood, you know, like engage with them respectfully and try to give them that interaction that they're not getting now, you know, where they see that uh, you could disagree with somebody 
and it could still be a respectful conversation. Willer and others were heartened by the 2022 midterm results in which many Republican candidates who promoted election conspiracies lost their races. 2024 is the final battle. That's going to be the big one. And yet, with former President Donald Trump, who continues to deny his own loss in 2020, looking like the strongest contender for the Republican nomination in 2024, Willer says we are not out of the woods yet. I think it's very possible it's going to get even worse before it gets better. Uh, we haven't reached that point, you know, where powerful interests on the, on the left and right, party leaders, high-level donors have realized, oh, we actually should be working together to work on this, this Pandora's box that we've opened up. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet, and that might be the way that it's most realistically going to happen, is that the, the harms of political division, destabilizing our society or economy, uh, that unites powerful interests to take some sort of action together. Uh, but in the, in the near term, all we have is us, and you can never tell what can happen from the results of collective action. Amid some very real challenges, signs of hope that Americans can find a way forward. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Judy Woodruff in Palo Alto, California.